All right. So, uh, so Kareem's going on and off. Welcome everybody. I know this is supposed to be, uh, this is supposed to be 11 a.m., but we like to let people get in here. So, uh, as you're as you're joining this chat, we're going to be talking about some of the top stories from the week in the R cryptocurrency subreddit. We are the Crypto Basic Podcast. You can always check us out at CryptoBasicPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcast media. So, yeah, all right, we'll get it started. We're about four. We're about four minutes in. We'll let everybody kind of trickle in here. But like I said, we're, we're gonna. We already got. A, we already got a question here, Brent. We already got a question, and uh, the question is, what is this all about? So, is, yeah. I'll go ahead and get it. Get it started. What this is about is uh, we we agreed to come on once a week, every Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time, and we're just gonna discuss some of the the most upvoted posts of the week in the our cryptocurrency subreddit we're going to go over some q a afterwards and we're just going to hang out for an hour and talk as much crypto as we can yep this is going to be similar to what you would find on our flagship friday episode except we're specifically going to talk about only posts in this in the our cryptocurrency subreddit we do get a lot of our content from there a lot of times anyways but we are going to uh we're going to talk about what you guys have going on out there usually it's pretty fun so if you haven't been on here in the past couple weeks uh, you can check it out on YouTube, I think, and that will. Uh, <laughs> I, I heard somebody leave. <laughs> I, I heard like, oh, what's this about? We told them they're like, nah, fuck this, we're out. <laughs> All right. So, are we recording? Yeah, yeah. Oh wait, no, we don't have the uh, uh, the the bot. What, what's that guy's name? Um, Craig. Craig, let's get Craig in here. Yeah. Now recording. <laughs> All right, got him, man. That, Whoa, uh, I, is that the first time Craig has communicated with us like that? That was dope. Craig is becoming Very self-aware. Intense. Wow, about time, Craig. I'm a little <laughs> disappointed. All right, so let's let's get it let's get it started, boys. Let's talk about these let's talk about these stories. Kareem, I know you found the biggest story of the week so far. Mass adoption <laughs> is coming. What? Did you find the most interesting? And I find it interesting that you found this interesting and not me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, so let's be real, guys. We have to lead off with the biggest story of the week. And as you guys can see here, Walmart is now selling Bitcoin candy. They're doing it, guys. Ma- mass adoption is here. They're selling Bitcoin candy. <laughs> little, We've made little, it. Uh, the chocolate. You know how they used to make a little doubloons? That's how we knew, by the way, that the balloons were actual accepted currency by pirates because they started making them into chocolate. Well, now Bitcoin is being made <laughs> chocolate. Uh, Bitcoin so is chocolate. This now, is a real crypto. Listen, there is a worldwide kind of chocolate shortage, right? Like chocolate is becoming more and more of a commodity. And now here we are with Walmart's attempt at a kind of a physical currency of chocolate Bitcoins. I feel like if we buy and hold, there's a very good chance that these are going to be worth more than a dollar a piece. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so I, I haven't looked I, at I the love... chart. <laughs> My favorite comment, by the way, uh, somebody user the kale main wrote, "quote After I buy them, I'm going to turn them into shit coins and dump them." <laughs> Come on, oh, that's nothing better for this for this group of guys than some chocolate being dumped. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Oh man. There's, you know what, that, that's, that is the literal <laughs> $1 dollar chocolate better than Tether. No question about it. I didn't write it down. Mm-hmm. By the way, there was another comment that said they were waiting for the dark chocolate hard fork. And <laughs> I have to say, I'm totally on board. 100%. You're a dark no chocolate way. guy? No, Hell what is wrong yes, with you? Oh my God. Really? Are you guys milk chocolate peasants? Yes. I, I mean, I'm a white chocolate kind of guy, but if I got to choose between milk and dark, I, I, it's I'm not white close. chocolate for sure as well. White chocolate is not even chocolate. That, that's fine. Wait, is, All it, right, fine. is that away. a. It, look, is, Satoshi's vision was milk <laughs> chocolate. Bitcoins. I don't want to hear anything <laughs> was, about dark not. chocolate Bitcoin cash. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, everybody knows that the ranking for chocolates goes dark chocolate, white chocolate, no chocolate, milk chocolate. Just saying. I'm just kidding. I like milk chocolate too, guys. I'm I'm not complaining. But dark chocolate is the best. <laughs> uh, all joking around aside, though, that's all I wanted to cover with that story. I know it was I know it was fireworks. 
Wow, man, we're we're really keeping people in the chat. We're like, all right, you guys came for some great analysis. We're talking about chocolate. <laughs> now, to be uh, fair, real quick, I, Kareem is the least qualified to talk about chocolate out of the three of us. And no shot. You guys like milk chocolate over dark chocolate. You've exposed yourself as non-chocolate connoisseurs. Which I am one of us do you think is, has eaten the most chocolate in their life or even this week? I think you've eaten more anything than all <laughs> than all of us, but that doesn't me- make you a chocolate expert. Your mouth is indiscriminate. You just oh, yeah? put anything in it. What's the best chocolate that you've ever had? Oh, oh okay. This is going to be a cool, braggy experience. Go ahead. Tell us. Oh, no, no. You tell us. What is the best chocolate you've ever had? Uh, I don't... I can't pick off the top of my head. It was probably a dark chocolate, though. <laughs> it, yeah, no. He So the best chocolate Kareem's ever had is Norman Love chocolate. And it is... Oh, my God. I introduced him to it. It is way far and away the best chocolate he's ever had. I know that. And I just trapped him into admitting that I was a chocolate expert. All right. So let's move on to some crypto, shall we? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. One of the actual big stories of the week that was that was important for crypto adoption is Square getting a crypto patent, right? They were approved for a cryptocurrency patent, and we've talked a lot about Square being a great, great option for pushing mass adoption because if they all of a sudden can take crypto, that makes a lot of food trucks, a lot of random... Uh, oh. We forgot to post the link. I'm sorry. Hold on. It's coming. Uh, th- uh, this isn't the subreddit link. Ah, oh, we screwed up. So that's actually the CNN link. Uh, unfortunately, that's not from the subreddit. I- the CCN. CCN. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whoa, <laughs> no. CNN-, <laughs> CNN doesn't do a lot of cryptocurrency stories, Brent. Yeah, sorry. There you uh, go. Okay. Yeah. SGP for the win. Thank you, SGP. Um, anyway, the- it's accepted at all your local food trucks, your local coffee shops, anything hipster. They're taking this. We can get the hipsters to start using cryptocurrency. That's a step in the right direction. Um, I'm not 100% convinced that a patent is good for the space, like overall, having patents on this stuff. But basically what it looks like they're going to be doing is maintaining their own private blockchain, which I guess is the same thing as having a private ledger, uh, except that I guess that you might be able to have a block explorer on the Square private blockchain or something. But... They'll handle everything internally as far as squaring up. They're also saying that they will take uh, responsibility for any double spend attacks. And uh, Jack Dorsey, their CEO, is actually pretty pro-crypto. One one of the quotes from him is, off. He'll, there is a quote where he says he likes Bitcoin over everything else, but I think this quote is more apt. He says, the internet, does deserve, or, the internet deserves a native currency. It will have a native currency. I don't know if it will be Bitcoin or not. I hope... It is Bitcoin, or I hope it will be Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, this is this is like, uh, you know, very bullish. This is bullish here. So, something that immediately comes to mind that I I had never thought of before. Um, you know, when I thought of the name Square, it always just seemed like a shape, and never thought much of it. But being square with somebody is also the way you can make these transactions instantaneous and go from different currencies as and and that. Whole concept is just being square. So that's something I had hadn't really thought of. Their uh, website is squareup.com. <clears throat> oh really? <laughs> yeah. So they thought about it. <laughs> I thought it was Square Cash. I thought that was well. They have the Square Cash they... app, but Square, if you're like using it for business, uh, to do like you know as a payment processor, they have squareup.com is where you do it, and you get your like virtual uh, terminal uh, and all that stuff. Interesting. Get all the little card readers and stuff like that. I don't know if you guys saw, but one of the comments on here uh, on this particular thread was talking about how basically somebody came into our cryptocurrency to talk about how they were going to invest in Square, the company. They were going to buy stock. And apparently, according to them, they just got like destroyed a lot. Everybody's like, oh, you're an idiot for buying stock. And he said that at the time that he bought that stock, it was at $30. And Square stock is now around $90. So just a reminder that just because we're crypto enthusiasts doesn't mean we have to shit on the legacy world. And this individual made a smart investment. They saw a company that was growing and, you know, it's totally fine to invest in the legacy world and the legacy 
uh, stocks, especially if they're willing to be implementing what we believe is the future. Like there are going to always be private companies. Like everything isn't going to be a Dow running off of Dash or something like that. Like the there is going to continue to be private companies all over both the crypto space and the legacy world. And knowing which ones are willing to change with the times, like you don't want to get, you don't want to invest in the Kodaks that see the digital camera and say, nobody will ever use that. That's stupid. You want to see the squares of the world that are saying, no, like people are going to start using this. We need to implement this into our company. So that, you know, that's a square, the square experience from, uh, you know, I've, I've used them as square app. I've used them as payment processing for businesses. I've used them as payroll for businesses start to finish their user experience is awesome. So I, uh, you know, I'm never excited about more centralization in cryptocurrency at all, but we are, we still have payment processing fees for visa, mastercard, everything that isn't going away. So having those same payment processing fees to make things easier on businesses from square with crypto will be a step in the right direction. Even if we fundamentally, don't necessarily agree with the philosophy behind it. Uh, agreed. Agreed completely. So, yeah, it won't completely um, eliminate the fees, but it'll make it easier. <clears throat> I actually do own a couple shares of Square Cash. Uh, I got them on Robinhood, so uh, it was a little interesting tie in there. I I, I agreed with the, the principal. I, I like the company. I like where it's heading. And, uh, Honestly, we, I've said this before, I believe that um, if there's a company that can create a stable coin that can, I feel like that's our one of our paths to mass adoption more than trying to convince people to use Bitcoin. And when that happens, well, I think no, Bitcoin they're not, will be there's, the follow-up. They're not creating a coin. They're creating a ledger. I know that. That no, 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 no. I know Bitcoin. that completely. I Right. And I'm hi I'm throwing out a hypothesis that if this eventually adds a stable coin of some variety, I think that would be one of our fastest past the mass mass adoption. Yeah, you know, we have some stable coins like like our one dollar Bitcoin chocolates. <laughs> oh, sorry, Tether, yeah. They, well, I think Bitcoin chocolate's a little more stable, but that's okay. <laughs> no no, no question that chocolate has a more stable price. It's been uh, accepted accept a currency in a lot of places for hundreds of years brent hundreds hundreds it actually has you know what it is a pretty a pretty good commodity i think <laughs> all right so unless anyone had any questions uh it won't be on youtube until after we're done with it but uh, on youtube i'm actually recording the chat right now and because i just got a green screen i put my face in the corner so y'all are going to get to see me in the corner, like kind of pointing at the chat and, uh, and that. So he's got the prettiest face out of the group. So it's a good decision. Uh, yeah. I, if we were really putting our best foot face forward, we would use Kareem, but he didn't buy green screen. So he's, we can't put his face on anything. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, so let's move forward. The Bitcoin annual transaction volume, Kareem. What did you, you, you want to talk about this? Cause it's big. Hold on. I'm getting the, uh, I'm get, I'll, I'll get the link. You start talking. Yeah, yeah, I got it. And this time I actually got the Reddit link. There you go. You put the right one. All right. So this was one of the top posts, of course, and the title Bitcoin annual transaction volume reaches 1.3 trillion surpasses PayPal. All right. So as usual, we're going to have to dig in a little deeper because our community tends to be uh, gets really excited about any kind of hyperbolic titles. <laughs> hyperbolic. Thank you, Brent. All right. So first of all, um, the article starts with saying that the scaling problem for Bitcoin is obviously not that big of a problem since we just passed PayPal in transaction yeah. volume. But of course, we're not really talking about volume. We're talking about transaction value. The total amount of money in the total value that has been transacted in Bitcoin is $1.3 trillion. But that doesn't mean that there's actually the same amount of transaction volume compared to PayPal. Another thing to keep in mind there is that PayPal, a lot of people pointed this out in the, in the post, PayPal is mostly being used between people to buy things and pay for services. 
Whereas a huge proportion, and I'll be honest that I don't know exactly how to find the number, but a huge proportion of that $1.3 trillion in Bitcoin volume, we know that it's on exchanges. It's just, you know, Bitcoin being um, traded between wallets or being speculated on. That still has value, by the way. I don't want to say it doesn't because if billions and trillions and trillions of dollars of Bitcoin are changing hands because we're buying either other coins or buying and selling Bitcoin, that still counts. I just feel like it's a little bit um, not deceitful, but not necessarily like, you know, that we're not being completely transparent if we're saying that Bitcoin has surpassed PayPal, uh, especially when we're talking about usability. And Brent, I wanted your feedback on here because somebody <laughs> somebody was pretty mad at PayPal when they wrote this uh, this comment. And I know that you've had some issues with PayPal, even including our own editor. So there was a comment here by IID Kishalik. Pro looks like some kind of play of Kishalik, Holic, alcoholic. I don't know. Wait till you violate PayPal's acceptable use policy with no reason given. Had this happen to me with $5,400 in there and couldn't touch it for 180 days. So they made him a mandatory PayPal hodler. Right. Can you tell us some of your PayPal uh, interactions? Well, at, that sounds exactly like something that happened to Mike, like almost exactly. What mm -hmm. we've been dealing with is uh, we pay our editor via PayPal, and they have just been randomly holding the transactions for a week with no reason given. I, I mean, I I felt bad for this guy, so I all of my other transactions are going through fine. So I call PayPal and ask them what's going on, and the first person that talks to me says... Uh, oh, uh, yeah, well, sometimes transactions are just frozen like that for a week. We don't really know why. And I'm like, and I was just, I, I had to go through three people and I'm just telling them like, that's not an acceptable answer. This transaction is the only one that's having this problem. And now it's three weeks in a row. Why is this the only transaction having this problem? Finally, I get put to a supervisor that tells me, oh, it's because the transaction was declined from your bank a month ago. Everything will be fine on this date. And we're not talking about a large amount of money. We are not rich. Paying our editor is uh, is, is a nice luxury, but it's not much. So I'm like, it's it accounted for maybe like a total of a half a percent of the total accounts, uh, accounts value. And I'm like, what do you mean it was declined? Like my bank just didn't, it wasn't, an, there wasn't like not funds there. This is just, uh, so the guy couldn't even tell me anything further. But he's like, don't worry on the, on X date, it's going to be fine. Well, on that date, guess what? I sent another transaction or passed that date to the editor. It was on hold again. So they, like, PayPal is very, very annoying and difficult to work with. But Mike has a much worse story than that. Yeah, mine, uh, I was sending a bunch of poker transactions back and forth, which apparently, if I dug deep enough, was not part of their acceptable use policy. Um, but I find out by having my, my account was shut down and frozen for about 90 days. And I had somewhere in the range of uh three to four K in there. And it just kind of like, I eventually got a check sent to me, but it was like about 90 days after it happened. And it was just like pretty unreal. And Venmo does similar Venmo will shut your account down for putting in your comments as to why you're sending the money. If you put something that they don't like. Uh, I had to get people it, when they were paying me for fantasy football to make sure that they didn't mention that. I also had to, uh, it, when they were in the, uh, like, I, <laughs> I was, I'm struggling for the way to say this without like making it obnoxious. But whenever I pay somebody on Venmo, I always phrase it as if it's a sexual favor that I'm paying for to everybody. <laughs> So <laughs> I won't get into the specifics, but reading my transaction history to people is actually pretty funny. Uh, and <laughs> uh, yeah, I, like I'll, I'll give like a quick example. And you're going to get, you're going to eventually get banned for that. Like, I, I just want to be clear. They, like, yeah, they, anything I've heard. drug sex related, anything gambling related, like will shut your accounts down. They, they are all like supposed to be funny. But I'll, you know, I'll send, I've sent Mike money and I put on there like, you know, happy ending massage or something like that. And like, yeah, that apparently, you know, that's something you got to watch out for. Just more of the issues with centralization, PayPal, and I can't even be funny these days.
Can't even, uh, can't even make a joke. Can't even make a joke. Can't, e can't even pay for sex or drugs on Venmo just because it's illegal. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but as a quick side note, I do want to bring it back. SGP posted a link here, what we were saying at the beginning about the transaction volumes. And he posted a link to a Bitcoin chart with average transaction value. And as of right now, it's around thirty thousand dollars per transaction average right now. The the average average transaction value. So think about that. That means that a huge percentage of Bitcoin transactions that are being counted into this one point whatever trillion are just massive, massive movements of money that I don't know, it's just not it doesn't even make sense to compare it to individual PayPal transactions, like for example, you paying our editor or Mike paying somebody for a tournament or whatever. I mean, I just feel like, obviously, I am I much prefer Bitcoin, but clearly PayPal's volume is more reflective of real economic activity. Uh, it seems like. That number's a little bit inflated average. right now because $1 billion was moved this week uh, from one of the accounts that was like but, associated with Silk Road. No, but listen, it, it's kind of irrelevant in the big picture because I'm looking at the chart right now and what you see here is like, yeah, there's a little spike. I can see the spike that you're talking about. But before this, it was 22,000 or oh, 23,000. Okay, 000, okay right? so it's not that and, and, and if you go back, right, and if you go back a few months, not even before January, I'm just talking about like, you know, June, July, we're, we're looking at 50K, 60K. So it's it's not that. That's just a short-term thing. It's still, the the main point is still that, the value for Bitcoin is probably not the right way to look at it just because you have these big sums of money being moved around and representative of, you know. Right. Bitcoin is buying. not currently a PayPal competitor, despite the way that that, uh, that article made it sound. There, there just Correct. isn't really any Agreed. comparison right now, despite how awful the experience is with PayPal. So hopefully enough people have as terrible of an experience with paypal as i have and move to square where they can buy crypto right now or uh or they can <laughs> or they can buy crypto uh at their local food truck soon so so somebody on here posted uh probably <laughs> satoshi didn't expect bitcoin to be this expensive um I, this is just a random uh tangent but what what do you guys think this is totally speculative what do you guys think Satoshi viewed as division? I've even heard it uh, mentioned. I don't remember by who. I want to say it might have even been Charles Huskinson or something. But that Bitcoin was almost like a proof of concept. That it was never even really expected to go the distance kind of thing. What do you guys feel about that? That seems very reasonable to me. It, it seems more like, you know, the vision was to sit down and say this crash of 2008. Like, this is the end of it. Like, the idea was we are going to put this together. Or I'm going to put this together in such a way that this is the idealistic vision of what it could become. Obviously, that's so long ago that it's changed drastically by now. But I, I would imagine that there's a pretty good chance that this was very unexpected. Yeah. It, you know what? Um, we could probably ask Craig what he was thinking, like, when he did this originally. But... The... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, man. no. All right, the, sorry. The sorry. recording bot, right? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Wait, that's yeah. <laughs> Craig, uh, the recording bot. Yeah, Craig, the bot. Yeah, Craig, the bot. You're probably more qualified to talk about Bitcoin than Craig Wright was. But yeah, you know, he made it. Uh, Crypta made a very good point. He made it so that you could split it down really far. I think if you are hoping that this is this takes hold and control, I think. You're thinking, yes, I hope that this becomes worth a lot of money someday. I think I'm I'm hoping that this becomes uh, very valuable. But you're not prepared for what actually happened. There is no way to predict this kind of stuff. Like, think about every company you hear that you're like, uh, that company started out as what? Like, like wasn't YouTube originally uh, like a specifically for porn or something? Or no, they were a dating site. They were a dating site. So, like, you hear about, like, the way things start, and then they all pivot into this, like, different, complete pro project or product. So, Bitcoin, I can almost guarantee you today, is absolutely nothing like what Satoshi had envisioned Bitcoin being, like, in, in his wildest dreams. 
Now, is it better? Is it worse? Is it is he happy with one megabyte block sizes with Lightning Network, or is he happy with Segwit? I don't, who knows? He couldn't have predicted any of that. We cr- we created that because as what he could predict was that the community would take that coin and roll with it and do exactly what it was intended, which was to be uh, maintained, created by the people. Now, there's arguments about w- who those people are. Is there too much centralization in Bitcoin? We're not going to get into that, but re- but I think really that Satoshi uh, could never have predicted where we're at now with the speculation, but probably thought that it would be nice if it happened. So that's why it was able to be split down to the Satoshi. And by the way, I have to mention this since you mentioned the Craig Wright and it wasn't in our outline. But did you see the post that was here on cryptocurrency, our cryptocurrency, about um, basically Craig Wright getting embarrassed again because it turns out he didn't know uh the difference between bits and bytes there's like an entire uh, oh my god that's in addition to like copying and pasting somebody's code totally totally separate new here let me this is the just a specific link (laughs) oh i'm sorry auto mode Uh, i'm getting banned sorry i i'm spamming i'm spamming the network uh, I'm going to crank it back a notch. Just relax a little bit. Sorry, Slow Arkham. it down. But yeah, this is just another hilarious exchange where, you know, again, it, it's so funny in the sense that, like, you can be a big deal by just being in the game early on. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like Craig Wright could have gone, like, he could do so well just by being like, yo, I was in this space early, early, early on. Without having to pretend to be Satoshi and just constantly exposing himself. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I I don't know, like, uh, from what <laughs> when you read about like the different things that he's doing, like it's clear that <laughs> he I don't know, like he just made he just said this lie and like now he's just got to roll with it. Like he doesn't he doesn't have an option. He's just got to like. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what else to do. Like you gotta, you, it, it's like in poker when like you know you're gonna get called when you bluff the river, but like if you check, you're gonna lose too. So like you don't know which way to go, and you just bluff, and then you get called, and you're like, damn it, I knew I shouldn't have done that, but I had to be committed to the, to the, uh, yeah, to the cause. <laughs> and then you decide, and then you decide that the best action is to still pretend like you weren't lying, but then now pretend like you're going back into hiding for reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, you gotta. I mean, that's very McAfee esque. Uh, he's always talking about people chasing him and, hey, Team B, Team B, we're meeting at this place. Uh, team C, here we go. Like his. I like pretending that that's real. I just my life's <laughs> much better. Just just believing that McAfee is like everything that he says is true and everything that he says is real. I just I just enjoy that better. Have either of you guys seen the documentary Get Him to the Gringo or whatever whatever the McAfee one is or crazy? No. Uh, no. I, okay, so there's an entire documentary about McAfee, which I haven't seen, but that I really want to see. And this is going to sound so messed up, but it's just the truth. Uh, somebody commented that apparently, like, there are girls in there that said that McAfee to, like, poop on him. I'm not even lying. <laughs> Oh, well, you know what? <laughs> I'm not even lying. Okay, so okay, somebody right, guys. watch yeah. that shit. In, yeah, that is that is correct. That is the rumor that I heard from what we're seeing right here. Okay, okay. All right. The three of us need to sit down and watch this and just record our commentary watching this. <laughs> that's that's got to be – that would be gold, right? That's probably not a bad idea at all. Yeah, but what if awesome. we get, like, too excited? I don't know. Like, the, the idea of – of having a girl sit in a hammock over top of me is just like, oh. Oh, wait, no, it's not uh, supposed to be like that. Uh, okay, so Brent got a little excited here with the with the whole details. I think of it's this pretty movie. creative. Uh, I think it's disgusting. You know what? No, like, okay, <laughs> if you're coming up, like, let's say that you want people to shit on you, right? <laughs> and you're trying to come up with a solution to the problem that makes it as comfortable as possible for the person who's going to be shitting I think on you. It's a great solution. You know what? <laughs> a hammock that they're like already super relaxed and comfortable and just happens to have a hole right there where you're laying under you know what as far as uh user experience is concerned i feel like he's done a good job <laughs> here's what i okay here's what I much better than mcafee the product 
I, I will definitely say that if somebody has this in their range, it's like an ultimate trump card, though. Even if the argument has nothing to do with it. Like, if I was having a fight with somebody and they were just like, listen, you little shit, I pay people to shit in my mouth, I would just immediately, like, back down. I don't want anything to do. Like, I, I fold whatever we're arguing about. I'm going to be like, you're right, dude. I'm running away here. Uh, yeah, it is. Any, any. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it did. It did. It did. Let's 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 focus. God. We should we should watch we should watch the documentary according to Bennis Market. I like it. All right, all right, Kareem. I I look this one up, but I feel like you're gonna have a lot to say about this. I, again, I grabbed the wrong link. I didn't grab the uh, the Reddit link, but this is the this is the link that we're gonna be talking about. So this this was kind of trending today. There was a New Jersey couple that was pulled over for a failure to maintain their lane and ended with all of their money but $2 being taken from them. Um, it, the, the police like got them in the car. They took them out. It, according to their account of everything, it sounds like they did everything right. Uh, they had won the money in a casino. They had their W2Gs in the car with them from winning the money. They won it at Charlestown Casino in West Virginia, which both Kareem and I have actually been to. Um, and they were going back home to Atlantic city. They, uh, they, so they were driving away from that casino. They had all the money. They also had a, like a metric ton of gift cards. Now there are a couple of explanations for having all the gift cards. The number one is that they've been saving up comps and they got a lot of gift cards for it. The other one is something that people do is they take other people's, uh, they take other people's, uh, players cards and run up the comps on those so that they can get the gift cards from, multiple players cards because once you hit like the the quick bonus that you get for showing up your returns diminish past that point so they probably had other people's players cards which is probably not legal i, I don't actually i don't know that it would be illegal but the casinos wouldn't like it but um so the the gift cards threw well, they, the cops off they could take the gift cards yeah yeah and they did they took them they took all the gift cards and they took the ten thousand it was like ten thousand four hundred dollars in cash so We've all kind of had this happen to us in one way, shape, or form, where we're going on a flight to Vegas and we're like, shit, man. Like, okay, you need to hold like $5,000 because I have 15 grand on me and I don't want to like have this happen to me in an airport because like 10 grand is the magic number that they'll just take that shit, right? And a lot of poker players have had a lot of horror stories about really being, uh, you know, searched through. And we also have horror stories from, uh, I'm, I, I write for Annie Up Magazine, and they have these cruises all the time. And Kareem was on one of the cruises with me that they decided to crack down particularly hard. And all of the poker people got messed with. Everybody who was coming on for that group got searched for 10000 cash. Now, these these poker cruises are not that high stakes. Like, you go on, the games are, like, very, sm like very small. They're, they're a 300 max buy-in. You don't play that much of it. It's only for, like, four days. But the people running the cruises will often have a lot of money and there's a lot of chips and the chips. If you take them as face value are going to add up to more than $10,000. So it, uh, the, the poker room manager, his name was Ramsey. He was, you know, unfortunately he's also Arabic. So he was getting double fucking hit on that <laughs> one. So they, they kept him for like four hours, just like interrogating him, going through all this stuff. This is a very legitimate argument for why, cryptocurrency is just like it's going to catch on for situations like this like why don't i just hold in bitcoin while i'm on my flight and then even if i don't believe in the thing like it's not going to change that much while i'm flying to vegas and i'll just switch it out when i get there with somebody or whatever you know so um yeah and especially this, if it's easy for you to do that yeah yeah you know exactly. what you know what, brent like if, if they make it easy why why would you ever take this risk right now i know people will take will take uh chips They'll, they'll put like 5k chips in their pockets for the flights because they'll just say that it's like not really worth any they'll say that it's not money it's like whatever and for the most part people aren't going to understand that so they'll fly with chips as opposed to flying with cash but still that could be taken too so like you gotta you gotta protect yourselves so the end result of this story is they do get their money back but they only got their money back because a Charlestown uh, sit, uh, a Charlestown councilman got involved went up and met them and was like, wow, this is crazy. And of course, like Charlestown, uh, West Virginia is like, they, they have that casino. They're going to be very um, pro casino. Like that casino is pretty much the only reason anybody goes there as far as I know. 
and uh, or like whitewater rafting or whatever and uh and he goes up he meets them they end up getting uh the media involved and as soon as the media gets involved all of a sudden magically they release their money back to them and they're like okay yeah you didn't do anything wrong yeah i mean this is the the worst part about this is like what is exactly the reason again that's being given for taking these people's money i mean i know you at the beginning said i would have something to say about this but it's i freaking hate civil forfeiture it's so ridiculous like the idea that you can have your assets taken away from you without being charged with a crime obviously it's a different story like if you're saying we believe that you obtained these funds illegally and we're taking them and here's the charge that we're going to get and we have to prove it and if we can't prove it all right fine you get that money back or whatever but so many legislatures so many districts here in the united states it's structured in a way that the police department can literally just take it and the burden of proof is on you. They don't have to charge you with a crime. It's almost like it's your responsibility to, in this case, what? Get a councilman involved, get the media involved, try to make a big scandal about it so that maybe you get your own money back. I mean, it's totally ridiculous whether you're on the right or the left. This is a huge abuse of power by a centralized force that has a monopoly on violence. More than anything else, though, it's it's just an absolute invasion of privacy. And it's essentially saying that the, the, the acceptance of cash is no longer okay. And basically, it, what they're assuming is that if, if you have cash, you're doing nefarious things with it. And I, and I just can't understand how people in power can actually use that mindset. There's so many people that use cash for so many legitimate reasons. And you know, I can't even tell you how many times I've driven to casinos for large amounts of gift cards. You know, I, I drive, you know, an hour and a half to Immokalee and get a $250 gift card when they offer them. And there, there's all types of little things that I could see any, any part of this story happening to me. And it would be like unbelievable. Absolutely. And it's not even just about cash because so SGP posted a link here to a John Oliver civil hours, civil forfeiture episode. And if I remember correctly, one of the stories in that episode was about someone's parents. Apparently, this kid was like cooking meth or something like that. He got arrested, but he did it in the garage. So they took the parents' house that didn't belong to the kid. What? Jesus. I, so we're not, we're not just talking about, you know, the police grabbing cash because they're unapproving of cash. We're talking about the government or the institution that has force being able to take your just assets away from you from cash to valuables, to jewelry, to whatever, even a home based on what, like your kid was cooking meth or something like that. I mean, I understand that that's an extreme. Have example, you seen breaking bad? Like someone's house is an extreme example. Let's be honest. If, if your kids are cooking meth, eventually you're going to cook meth and then you're going to just become fully evil and just start killing everybody. So that's a good, you point. know what? This was really Man, a bad that example. Is a pretty good point. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say they were going to grow up to an RV. No, no, no. They started the yeah, RV. The, 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 the RV is like the first experiment. That's you go way past that. You know, I haven't gotten around to starting uh better call Saul. I've heard it was good, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. It's as, as good as breaking bad. If not better, we'll see how it ends. What? As good as Breaking Bad? Breaking Bad's the best series I've ever seen start to finish. And I was better call like Saul five episodes in uh, better, better Call Saul. It was, it was a little slow to start for me. Yeah, it's more funny than, like, it's more comedy than Breaking Bad. Although there's, it's got a lot more uh, feel to it than I expected from such a shitty character. All right, can, can we talk about crypto? Jesus. <laughs> Fair enough. Bring us back. Uh, all right. Kareem, what have you figured out about our buddy, substratum i know we've made some jokes about uh about eos maybe needing to do or eos needing to do a second ico in the future uh what do we what do we know about uh substratum here and what, what's going on well as as you guys know i have <clears throat> always been skeptical of projects that have one ico or less it just feels <laughs> like they're not trying hard enough you know what i'm saying so <laughs> i'm I'm happy to report, though, however, that this will not be the case with Substratum. They are now working on their second SEO here. Let me get a link here. Oh, Brent, I did it again. I got the the non 
RCC uh, link. I, I am so our, sorry. Yeah. Th- this week we just do we got our heads up our butts and we are not. So here, here's the, the right here's the link to the article. Brent is going to go and find the Reddit link. Oh, he is. All right. To the actual on. discussion. Yes, Brent is going to do that while I talk. But anyway, so here's the b- brief breakdown of this uh, article that got posted. More or less, Substratum has essentially two products right now. One of them is something called Substratum Node and Substratum Host, which from what I gathered is basically like a VPN service and a web hosting service that would be de- decentralized. Totally legit. Sounds good. Their second product is their actual, let's say, cryptocurrency, their cash, crypto pay, they call it. But that's the actual just coin and, you know, the whole drill. "Ah, I want to replace cash and all that. What's interesting, though, is that they have just been been teasing product number three, which they announced, and it's supposed to be a decentralized exchange. Have you guys ever heard of those? Oh, yeah, yeah. know anybody? Yeah. (laughs) So it's the the first one there. Yeah, exactly. But here's the part that gets really interesting. They're not just adding a decentralized exchange to their current network. No, no, no. They are building a decentralized exchange from scratch, and they are launching a brand new ICO to raise the funds to get this separate decentralized exchange that's going to have a separate token. And for their ICO, they will accept Tether, Bitcoin, Ethereum, but guess what they will not accept? Well, of course, they'll also accept the token from their other projects, right? Absolutely not, Brent. Why would they do that? And now now they claim that it has something to do with some kind of um, regulatory compliance or something like that. But here's the bottom line. Ultimately, what this article posits is that the development team has essentially run out of money. Their ICO raised $13.8 million. Obviously, any that they had in Ethereum or Bitcoin or anything like that has gone down even further. And basically, the author of the article is saying, what if they're launching a decentralized exchange, which is literally the most competitive field that you can get into right now in crypto. There's a ton of major exchanges that are working on it. There's a ton of individual projects that are working on having a decentralized exchange. So the hypothesis of the article is what if they are doing an ICO to run something that they know will fail and it's the one thing that they know they can basically try and are almost guaranteed to fail and nobody will question it. Um, And then, of course, the discussion goes from there. (laughs) And my favorite comment before we actually, you know, break in and get some of your thoughts on this, but I love this comment. The Cryptopotamus, Cryptopotamus said, quote, you mean that a coin that paid John McAfee to shill it on Twitter isn't legitimate? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Imagine that, Brent. Imagine that. You know so, who else had their own exchange product and they would only accept Bitcoin and then give you their token in uh, in return? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. No, no, no. I'm not saying Substratum's yeah, a scam. Well, I don't know enough yet, but uh, I would say that there's some certain bad. parallels. There's some certain red flags. And we just had Anthony Lusardi from the Ethereum uh, Classic Cooperative on the show. And he was explaining to us, he's like, look, you you do need millions of dollars to to get a project off the ground. But that's all you need. You don't need $50 million. You don't need $100 million. You do need millions. You don't need billions, and um, he's he's a little skeptical of projects that end up taking too much money because their incentive is now to just rather than try and spend that, just take it. Um, yeah, this is very, very, very bad. I, um, you know, I, I I'm not gonna tell you sell your substrate. I'm not. Who knows? Like, like, like the other bad news on the other shitty projects. Like when bad shit happens to Verge, the pr- the price goes up. So. Just make sure you, you know, don't invest in anything more. If you, you've already got this stuff, I don't know what to do with it. But look, I'll take the opportunity as a reminder. We've talked about a few things on the show before. So for those of you that haven't heard Crypto Basic in the past, one of the things we talk about is we love treasuries and we like treasuries significantly more than just ICOs because the idea that you give a development 
even if they're well-intentioned, even if they're smart guys, even if they have a cool vision, the bottom line is you're taking a small group of people and you can either A, give them, here's $30 million and you know manage it well, good luck, see you in five years, or you can have a sustainable uh, you know, source of revenue for the project that is completely correlated and dependent on the well-being of the network. You could have something that maybe the community gets to have an input on, um, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You this can is bet on Augur that you're going to meet your goals, like... <laughs> true, I, true. I, I, there's there's you need to have a check and balance here like I, I don't people respond to incentives if you get a billion dollars and you're like yeah i'm gonna make this thing it's gonna be amazing and even if you want to make that amazing thing you're just like well shit now i got a billion dollars i can spend some of it to make this thing but i already have a billion dollars so <laughs> what, okay let me make it look like i'm gonna do something so i don't get sued yeah, but and look, just to to emphasize it, even if you have good intentions, like I don't know how how well do you think you would manage uh, a uh, fifty million dollars? Like that's not easy to manage, you know. When you're you have to literally budget out how you're going to pay out your team. How do you think the expenses are going to turn up? You have to look three years into the distance and try to account for the price fluctuations. You need to account for growth. You need to account for marketing, development, research. This is not easy to do. So. However, I think we agree though. Anytime that a coin starts talking about their second ICO, I'm sorry, fuck off. <laughs> oh wow, some strong words here from sorry, sorry. normally the see. most uh, reserved member and professional <laughs> of the team. Uh, wow. Yeah, this is uh, again. It looks looks very very bad. Hopefully, they don't take too many people down with them. More than anything else, to me, what I think is the most likely scenario is that they're just irresponsible and not good with managing money, and they've made a lot of bad decisions. And, like, you can have plenty of smart developers that are not good business people and plenty of really intelligent crypto people that don't know how to keep this all together. And that's what this most likely seems to me. It just seems like mass, vastly unorganized and probably irrational you know thinking as far as you know marketing and decision making okay yeah, they probably spent the, the question, money though, and, Mike. Uh, now one they okay, could be scamming. exactly though they, they could have spent the money okay they, no but oh good they're not mutually exclusive though that's what i that's what i'm that's what i want to point out is okay fine we can whether or not they mismanage the funds or they have the funds or they don't have the funds the bottom line is do we think that the second ICO is legitimate like they have no other recourse or is this just an opportunity to get more money from the community without being upfront and transparent about what's really going on? And I got to be honest with you, it seems like the other one but I haven't researched substratum enough. Does it matter? But like you're just Yeah, exactly. No, no, you're no. launching my, the second ICO. My argument is that if that is the most likely scenario, what I suggested, then that's a huge red flag and you should massively avoid. Yeah. Even if uh, they had the, the best case, like the nicest scenario here is that they just kind of ran out of money and they don't have enough money to get a decentralized exchange off the ground. That means that they took the money that they raised from that ICO and blew it. Basically. Um, let's, let's Google real quick how much they originally raised. Uh, I I'll do it. it. You talk. Thirteen point eight million dollars. Thirteen point eight million, and they. Uh... Yeah, because you know some of us research before we get on here. <laughs> okay. Well, geez. Oh my god. Was it in the outline? Yeah. I probably look the yeah. Outline. Boom. But anyway, uh, I'll admit, yeah, thirteen million dollars is not like <laughs> the biggest amount, and I'm sure that anything, anybody who launched like an ICO in August or something like that last year. And then they didn't liquidate, and then they just saw like everything disappear. I'm sure they were having a rough time too. Yes, yeah. I, maybe what actually happened was they started spending a ton of money, then they lost eighty percent, and they're like, "Oops, should shouldn't have done that." He's just a boy. Yeah. If anybody's interested, though, uh, that they, they want to look at more in depth, the article that we posted, uh, well, the article that the community posted and shared with us actually includes some specific trailing of the accounts. Like they show how much Ethereum was leaving oh. the account uh, per month. And then they, they make some more uh, 
in-depth speculations about that. Like they try to pinpoint where they think that they ran out of money, where they had some problem. I can always appreciate somebody that does that with like the evidence. That is nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. They admit themselves that it's speculative, but at least they are telling you that it's speculative and then showing you the evidence that has caused them to reach their conclusion, which, hey, that's all we ask for, right? Yes. So interesting little uh, little article here by uh, by Bob in the chat that he got he posted. Apparently, Tron was the only one trying to buy BitTorrent, uh, the comp- the BitTorrent company, not so much the protocol, but the uh, Neo did made a bid, but did not um, did not actually succeed. And I di- I haven't had enough time to read over this entire. Article. So honestly, Bob, have you read this article? And if you have, would you be interested in talking with us about it? Mm, I like that. You, you get to close out the show with us, Bob. Do it, Bob. Do it. He's typing. Oh my God! Here it comes. Big reveal. <clears throat> if you if you don't want to voice chat, by the way, you could just give us some info in the chat. That's fine. But you should voice chat. <laughs> Here, all, it, it, it would be like a great troll if he just like put a space and then walked away from the computer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. yeah I've walked away from the keyboard. And we're all just looking at Drop it. The it's mic. typing. It's typing. Yeah, that that would be uh, that would be the that would be the best troll. It, it's also entirely possible that he's not set up on a mic and he might be just typing. Um, uh, Torrent was sold to Tron instead. Oh, Neo bid That's fifty million insane. more. Yeah. Yeah, Tron's was 120 million and Neo's was a 170 million dollar bid. I'm trying to dig through it real quick. Why would they sell to Okay, so we don't like to talk about specific coins. We are not here to show any particular projects, but definitely I can speak for the podcast when I say that we all think Neo is a much more serious project than uh Tron. Yes. How the hell did they pass up on an extra 50 million? There's got to be more to that story. Yeah, uh, because Tron aims to decentralize the internet. Oh, that's right. I, I mean, that's that's what I got so far. I'm still digging. Wow. Uh, okay, so maybe. Okay. Yeah. Well, I it, one like of that. the concerns about the Neo project is the way their their delegated proof of stake works does create centralization. Now, um, at the same time, I the people who would have the the they kind of want to say the morals, but the the people who would have those ideals for decentralizing the internet and going forward, I feel like would be totally cool with Neo or totally like not cool with Tron. I don't like, there's no necessarily an indication that Tron is significantly more decentralized than Neo as far as I know. But um, uh, for similarity, so the two projects did not offer the same deal. Uh, BitTorrent's board nonetheless said that the documents that, NGC's offer was not more favorable to the company and its shareholders and accepted Sun's offer. So maybe there's still like maybe there's a percentage. Yeah, there's or more something. to it. Yeah, like maybe maybe there's definitely more to it, dude. Maybe it was fifty million dollars and like X amount of percentage in that stupid it, it looks uh, it looks like it was uh I, I found here Sun's final offer was ninety million dollars for all preferred stock and thirty million dollars for all common stock. So I don't know what the differences are, but oh, so maybe like maybe the people who had the preferred stock end up getting more per stock the way he structured the deal than uh, the way Neo structured the deal, and uh, I don't know. I I don't know enough about the differences between the preferred and the common. I know that, um, I I know that we're gonna feel really stupid if this works and Tron buying the the BitTorrent company somehow makes them able to create a viable product. Um, at the same time, BitTorrent is a protocol. It's not really like a company. That, now they have a company and that company has only failed at everything that it's done. Like the, the actual <laughs> BitTorrent company, they've only been, it's only been bad. So I'm, I'm interested as to why, uh, I, I'm more interested as to why this happened now that I know that the city of Zion was involved than I was before. You know what I mean? Like, here's, 
he, I'm going to make a totally no evidence whatsoever, pure speculation. I probably shouldn't even do it, but here's my opinion. No. Oh. Justin Sun and Tron find themselves in a position with a ton of capital to throw around a ton of pressure. And I think that they are more motivated and more centralized and therefore able to make a private deal that swings the pot in the right direction where they're just throwing money at it and trying to make something happen. I don't know. My guess is slightly more decentralized than Tron and it has, in my opinion, a more stable ecosystem, probably put an offer forward that you know, was more reasonable or equitable or I don't know. It just seems to me like Tron is in a better position to apply brute force. And I know that that seems ironic seeing as though this specifically says that Neo offered more money, but for BitTorrent to then specifically for shareholders to go with Tron, like you said, maybe there is something else, maybe how much cash goes up front or how much goes to preferred stock or whatever it is. But I would need to see very, very, very strong evidence to be convinced that um, this was anything other than just, you know, Tron being able to swing around a bunch of cash and not necessarily what was the best fit or any of those things. It's my opinion. I have very negative opinion. Yeah. Of Tron, uh, another uh, another interesting thing about this acquisition is that the uh, the creator of BitTorrent left the company after um, after Tron purchased them. And that's, it sounded like, you know, oh, it was over a uh, difference in opinion about how things should be. But really what happened was he was making his own cryptocurrency. So it was, <laughs> it was like, you know, I don't know how much that had to do with anything. Maybe like Neo was also requiring that that coin not go forward or something. Who knows? Uh, it's, it's tough to, uh, it's tough to see what goes on behind closed doors. But what I'm, what I am not surprised that uh there was some competition for bidding over what is very recognizably one of the things that helped the internet get to where it is today like like BitTorrent got us out of the Napster era so <clears throat> it's not surprising that people wanted I that it is surprising that they wanted it from a a company that has never done very well I believe I I referred to it as the the most successful decentralized product of all time. Even like I think BitTorrent was absolutely game changing. Yeah, I, I, well, maybe the internet, but other, and even though they're, I think it's past its time. Yeah. The um, there's a there's a lot of great that uh, has come out of has come out of BitTorrent. I mean, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of downloads that you can't make anymore safely. So is there any, yeah. now, whatever, anyway, any, any questions from mm. anyone that's listening, uh, for us, about us, about everything we realized, we just realized that it was 12. Kareem sent boop, me a boop. little message that said 12 and, uh, it's like, oh man. So, um, you know, time you, flies when you're having fun. Yeah. And I, I, I'm a, I'm on more of a time constraint than usual, but I will still stick around for a little bit to answer any questions that might be there if they're there. I'm so proud of Craig for recording this whole thing this time. Um, although, Craig, hopefully thank I you. do it right, too. <laughs> uh, big shout out to Craig. He's been fantastic. Uh, bull, <laughs> bull run, run incoming. incoming. <laughs> Bob, I can, answer, I can answer that question for you. The answer is absolutely. Uh, I believe there's going to be a bull run in Seville. in Madrid. So you can go <laughs> look for that in November. Pamplona, come on, get it right. Pamplona, there's some bull runs. Uh, if you're talking about the market, we have no clue. We never will. No sabemos. We're not experts. And the guys that claim they know, we call those liars. I did post a question on our Twitter this week where I said, look, what we would like from a, from a technical analyst is to just answer that base question. Why are you more qualified to look at that chart and make subjective connections than a computer would be to look at the same data and make a real conclusion based on what they're finding. And I haven't gotten a good answer yet. The answers that we get are humans are better at interpreting emotions, which eh, <laughs> there is a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. aspect of what's going on with technical analysis. But the end result is uh, when we, I think what we can say that we all believe is that when we look back at cryptocurrency, 
10 years from now, we are going to consider the past 10 year period, a very large bull run. And, uh, yes, I agree with that. Yeah. So I, I definitely agree with that. And look, just even if it's, it's possible that it's literally unpredictable, right? Like we've already reached a really high level of say, for example, weather tracking technology. And still to this day, you can look up what the weather is going to be like, and it says it's going to rain, and then it turns out it doesn't rain that particular day. Why? Because weather systems are inherently random. And no matter how good our tools get, there is going to come a point where we can't predict certain things because their occurrence is, by definition, random. And I would just say that there's a very good chance that markets and human psychology like this, maybe they're random. Maybe it doesn't matter how good our tools get. Nobody will ever be able to tell you when a depression or a recession or a bull run or whatever is coming because it's possible that it's inherently random. Yep. And, and w one thing we also say is generally, if they can do that, they're probably not giving you that information for free on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> or for nine 99 on Udemy or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. I have stocks that have never failed. You just need to sign up for my newsletter. Okay, and I will send you fantastic stock picks every week that never fail. Yeah, yeah, we'll give half of you one side, we'll give half of you the other side. Yeah, we'll make yeah. sure so half of you win. You half go long, you half go short. Look at how genius we are. Half of the people made money. All right, anything else before we wrap it up? I know I we had do it. some really poignant analysis. We talked about everything from from chocolate to John McAfee's butthole, to um, to real in-depth analysis on the uh, idea behind why BitTorrent may have been acquired by Tron versus Neo, or why we don't particularly believe that uh, technical analysis works in the long run. All right. All right. Let's do it. Let's, let's wrap it up. Craig, you can stop recording. This is the end of our weekly cryptocurrency roundup, our cryptocurrency roundup. We'll be here every week. Join us here. Join us on CryptoBasicPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And I think we have YouTube, too, where I put up Thanks a really stupid again, video this weekend. <laughs>